Good morning, everybody. So today we will be discussing the law of war, which might seem paradoxical uh, because war, as many uh, of you t would typically think about it, uh, is brutal, uh, is violent. So in many ways, war seems like the absence of law. So how can we talk about a law of war? Right? If war is the breakdown of law, then why would states ever agree to constrain what they do uh, using law in the context of war? After I've answered a few of these questions, we'll also discuss uh, contemporary issues relating to the law of war. So how has the war on terror affected uh, the international legal commitments of states uh, in the context of warfare? More specific questions, was the United States killing of Osama bin Laden lawful? We did not have permission from the Pakistani government to uh, invade their territory and to uh, kill people, right, to use armed force within their territory. Uh, and what about drone warfare? Maybe it's legal in the context of Afghanistan and Pakistan, since Pakistan has given us permission to use drones in their territory. And since we're at war, uh, in, in the conventional sense in Afghanistan. Uh, but what about Yemen and Somalia and these other places that we're using our drones? So how has the global war on terror potentially changed, potentially undermined certain laws of war? Uh, so here's the agenda for today. Uh, before we can talk about the particular case of the law of war, uh, I'll first tell you a little bit about international law, generally speaking, and then differentiate that from international norms, uh, since the two definitions might start to seem similar to you as we go on. Uh, and then we'll talk about just war theory, which is the basis of the law of war, uh, and then uh, the particular international institutions uh, that have codified or legalized just war theory uh, into treaties that states must abide by. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, briefly the law of war versus human rights, since that'll be your topic on Wednesday. Uh, and we'll conclude with the discussion of counterterrorism, drone warfare, and uh, contemporary changes for the law of war. So in the most simplistic sense, international law, right, generally speaking, international law, uh, is a set of rules accepted as binding resolutions between states uh, that regulate states' behaviors. Uh, and these are consent-based. So states do not have to abide by international laws unless they agree to uh, constrain themselves using international law. So states will sign treaties uh, and sign on to conventions and protocols uh, if they decide that they want to uh, be held accountable to the ideas within those things into the future. Uh, and there are three types of international laws. Uh, the first is the most basic, public international law. Uh, this is the content of international law, uh, the bulk of the content, right? So the laws of war are enshrined within public international law. Private international law uh, is the international law, the supporting structure of international law. So if a state or an individual uh, or a group were to violate uh, an issue of public international law, that would then instigate private international law. Uh, and this would be what agreements these states have to come to in order to decide how the violating individuals or states will be held accountable, uh, whose state's court system will be used to try these individuals, uh, potentially what international organization will be used to oversee those trials, uh, and so on. So private inter international law comes into play when uh, a conflict occurs in public international law. So if one state accuses another of violating international law, if one state accuses another state's citizens of violating an international law, public international or private international law will step in uh, and manage how that conflict is, is resolved. Uh, and then supranational law uh, is the international supporting structure of public international law. Uh, so the organizations and international courts uh, that states have created over time uh, to oversee issues of public international law. Uh, so not all issues of public international law have such uh, an international organization affixed to them, uh, but many of them do. So examples of international laws uh, or broad categories of international laws 
Uh, there's treaty law, so bilateral treaties between states, multilateral treaties between states. How do we guarantee that these will be abided by? Uh, there's a set of laws to govern those relations. The law of sea, right? So uh, how can states use the sea uh, for commerce? Where does a state's boundaries end uh, and another state's boundaries begin uh, outside of their, uh, outside of their uh, landed territory? International criminal law. Today we'll be talking about the laws of war uh, and international human rights law, which uh, you'll have a little bit of on, on Wednesday. So if international law is consent-based, if a state has to decide for itself that it will hold itself accountable in the future uh, to international laws, then why would any state decide to do this, right? Uh, why would a state have an interest in uh, holding itself accountable into the future? Uh, so we can use some of the same ideas that we've been discussing uh, in uh, the first part of the semester to explain this, uh, to answer this question. So according to your textbook, uh, there are three sets uh, of ideas that we can apply to explain cooperation under anarchy, right? So states have a desire to cooperate, uh, but must do so in an anarchic context. So international law becomes a potentially uh, useful set of institutions in order for states to achieve a particular type of cooperation under anarchy. Uh, and that particular type can be in a broad area uh, of potential topics, right? The law of sea, the law of war, and so on. Uh, but it's also a very specific way of regulating that co cooperation, using treaties, using conventions and protocols, uh, and having those things overseen by national courts and international courts. So up to this point, the definition of international law might seem familiar to the definition of international norms, right? Something that states do in order to regulate states' behavior. Uh, but there are important differences. So international law is formal in the sense that it's written down, right? States meet, uh, and in those meetings, they send delegates. Uh, and those delegates uh, negotiate over the content of international law, uh, draft a document, and then sign off on it. Uh, and then those documents then uh, are usually sent to domestic governments uh, and their Congress, uh, their Congress members uh, or their prime ministers or uh, in some cases the uh, authoritarian dictator uh, will decide whether or not they're going to put their signature on that international document to make it uh, domestically legally binding. Uh, so international law is formal. Uh, and you know it exists when you see these types of uh, formal mechanisms taking place. Uh, international norms are informal. You know an international norm exists when you see states behaving in a particular way uh, or speaking in a particular way. Uh, so for example, uh, an example I used in my discussion section, so some of you will be familiar with this, uh, an, an international norm against racism uh, was observable in the sense that governments sanctioned uh, the racist apartheid government in the 1980s. Uh, so how do we know that there was an international norm against racism? We saw states acting upon an idea uh, that was against racism. And so we can say uh, with a certain degree of, of assuredness that this norm exists. Uh, however, there's an interesting relationship between norms and law in the sense that some things that are norms uh, may eventually become laws. Uh, may eventually become the content of treaties and documents that states sign and approve. Uh, so, for example, the Vienna Convention on Treaties. Uh, before this particular treaty was signed, there was a norm that states must abide by uh, international treaties, right? So if a state would sign a treaty with another state, uh, they would have a normatively accepted belief uh, that those two states would honor that agreement. Uh, however, states eventually decided we want to make it legal and formal that states will abide by treaties. So they took the norm of uh, complying with treaties and made it a law of complying with treaties. Uh, so norms can become laws. So are there any questions up to this point about international law, generally speaking, and the difference uh, between international law and international norms? Mm -hmm. Mitch? Mitch? 
the third thing was institutions. Uh, so international law is a particular type of international institution uh, that's codified in these formal documents. Anyone else? Okay. So that's international law, generally speaking, right? Obviously, it's a bit more complicated, uh, but for the sake of uh, our purposes today, we can leave it there and move on to the more particular type of international law, the law of war. So the law of war, so taking a step back, uh, what is the purpose of war? According to the authors of your textbook, war occurs uh, when a bargain breaks down between states. And the only means that states have left available to them to resolve uh, the dispute uh, is armed conflict, is violence. So the law of war may seem paradoxical in the sense that war seems like it's the breakdown of law, right? It's the breakdown of something. It's, it's violent. It's brutal. Uh, it seems chaotic and unconstrained. Uh, but if we think about it in the sense that it's uh, a logical part of a bargaining process in an anarchic context, uh, then it might make sense that states would actually want to regulate this. If they have to resort to war, uh, then potentially they want to make war more humane, uh, despite the fact that it is, uh, by definition, going to be violent. Uh, so if war occurs, uh, states will want to control the severity of war. Uh, and potentially states will want to prevent war. They want war only in the cases where no other uh, solution is attainable. Uh, so they want to control the legitimate resort to war. They want to prevent some states uh, from creating illegitimate wars. In order to, and in order to do this, states have uh, begun to abide by this thing called the just war theory, the principles of just war. Uh, so this is a set of international norms controlling state behavior and armed conflict uh, that have become legalized uh, in particular conventions and treaties over time. Uh, and armed conflict, as it's being used here, it's just a broader category than war, right? So war is an armed conflict. Civil war is an armed conflict. Skirmishes that don't amount to a full-blown uh, full war are armed conflicts. Insurgencies are armed conflicts. Uh, and terrorism uh, is also considered an armed conflict, though uh, that is going to be disputed, uh, as we'll talk about in a few minutes here. Uh, so before I move on, I'll just note that uh, these slides have been updated this morning, right? So some of you may be looking at these if they're post it online, I'm not sure. Uh, if you are and you're noticing differences, uh, know that the updated slides will be available uh, after class. Okay. So there are multiple forms of constraints on state behavior uh, that could constitute the laws of war. So the broadest category, we can speak about the law of war, generally speaking, the entire body of things that might prevent states from behaving in a particular way in armed conflict. Uh, but we might break this down and talk about norms related to armed conflict that have not been codified in, in international laws. Uh, and we might talk about just war theory, uh, generally speaking, right? The written documents, the historical written documents that form just war theory, uh, which I'll talk about in, uh, in, on the next slide. Uh, and then, in the most particular sense, we might talk about these international treaties and institutions uh, that make up the written portion of the law of war. But all of these things are also interrelated. So the historical documents that began the idea of just war theory have become part of these international treaties. Uh, and certain international norms uh, that states were abiding by in armed conflicts have also become part of the content of these written treaties, right? So we can break it down, uh, but then we can also see that all of these parts are interrelated to a certain extent. Uh, so today, there are norms uh, that are not tr treaties, uh, and there are norms that have become treaties. Uh, and there are facets of just war theory that are being negotiated uh, or contested, uh, but there are also parts of just war theory that are relatively clear, uh, clearly stated in, in international law. Today we'll be talking about these two portions of this diagram uh, in, most de in, in the most detail, right? So we're going to leave uh, norms related to conflicts uh, off to the side, uh, but they'll be in the background to a certain extent. 
So how did we end up with the principles of the law of war, the principles of just war theory? Uh, so many of the ideas come from uh, the historical writings uh, of, a certain, uh, of certain key figures. So Hugo Grotius uh, was uh, a writer in the 1500s. He's a Dutch jurist. So he was a lawyer in the Netherlands in the 1500s. Uh, and he was compelled by the 80 years war between Spain and the Netherlands uh, and the 30 years war between uh, Catholic states and Protestant states uh, to uh, start to come up with a basis for what would be uh, just war theory or constraints on what states were able to do in the context of armed conflict. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s uh, had a similar sort of uh, history. So St. Thomas Aquinas uh, was asking the philosophical question, what should Christians do when they are attacked? Uh, so, in general, Christians want to be nonviolent, according to, uh, you know, the church's interpretation of the Bible. Uh, but if they are attacked, what should they do? Should they just stand by and be uh, harmed, or should they fight back? Uh, so, the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas became the basis of the doctrine of self-defense. Uh, and so, the self-defense then becomes a critical portion of just war theory. Uh, and then, more recently, in the 1800s, uh, this non-governmental organization, or NGO, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, started as an organization that would provide medical support uh, on the grounds in war, in war or armed conflict. Uh, and in being exposed to the atrocities of war, they uh, decided they wanted to try and make war more humane, that they wanted to lobby states uh, to start to create uh, an international legal framework to, con to control what states were doing in the context of war and what individuals uh, that belong to states were doing in the context of war. Uh, and was, as we'll see later, uh, the ICRC was so instrumental in uh, modern international law of war uh, that they've actually been given the responsibility of overseeing uh, the, the most substantial uh, modern international treaty, the Geneva Conventions. Uh, so the Geneva Conventions uh, are, over, are overseen by the, R, uh, the ICRC in the same way that the WTO oversees trade. Okay, so more generally, where do the laws of war come from? Where does just war, just war theory come from? Uh, as we saw on the last slide, individuals uh, can be issue entrepreneurs, right? Individuals can be uh, concerned about a particular uh, advocacy movement, right, or a particular idea, uh, and then lobby governments, right, or form NGOs. Uh, to lobby governments uh, and to have their ideas implemented internationally. Uh, and these ideas might become enshrined in norms before they become law. Uh, so we might have a particular set of ideas internationally that constitute international norms uh, that might be then legalized uh, in these written documents to become international institutions that are binding. So the result is the law of war, right? The just principles of the resort to and conduct in war, things that control state behavior in armed conflict, uh, laws that regulate this behavior. So non-governmental organizations have been particularly crucial in this process, right? The ICRC has been lobbying governments all throughout history uh, to facilitate this process. So just to give you uh, an idea of the com complexity of some of these uh, issues, this is not meant to confuse you, though it might. Uh, however, in international law, there's often overlap between certain uh, types of international law. So on Wednesday, we'll talk about international human rights. Today, we're talking about uh, the laws of war. Uh, international humanitarian law, this is synonymous with the laws of war. So this is another way of saying the laws of war, international humanitarian law. Uh, and this might be confusing because humanitarian law sounds a lot like human rights law. Uh, but uh, this is meant to be the laws of war. Uh, and then obviously law and customs of war sounds very similar to international humanitarian law. Uh, so this is mostly associated with the laws within war and over here uh, the norms of war and the laws of going to war uh, are, are differentiated. 
Uh, but this is just to note that a lot of these things overlap, right? Human rights can bleed into the laws of war and vice versa. Uh, and then one area where they all intersect is this thing called atrocity law. Uh, and we're not going to talk about this very much today. Uh, but just briefly, this is the law regulating genocide uh, or crimes against humanity. Uh, so after the Rwandan genocide in the 1990s, uh, we have the International Criminal Court, which oversees atrocity law, right? The most serious violations uh, of human rights law or international humanitarian law are found within atrocity law. Genocide, rape, uh, crimes against humanity, generally speaking, right? These types of things, uh, anything that's kind of racially based, ethnic based, religious based, these tend to be portions of atrocity law, right? But today we'll be mostly in the middle of that chart. So just war theory is broken down in two respects. And those two uh, facets of just war theory are use ad bellum and use in bello. And these are Latin phrases meaning the law of going to or starting a war, use ad bellum, uh, and the law within war, or the law of armed conflict once war has begun, use in bello, right? And here I have the, the breakdown of this Latin phrase. So use is the law or the right, ad is of or to, uh, and bellum is war generally speaking. Similarly, use in, it means the same as it does in English, uh, and then bello means fighting, right? So a more particular case of bellum uh, is bello, which means the actual engagement of conflict, the actual fighting, whereas bellum is more of the idea of war, generally speaking. So first, you said bellum. So you said bellum has three main components, uh, and then self-defense is broken down into three further components. Consent means that a state may lawfully go to war may go to war in compliance with use ad bellum uh, when another state tells it that it may. So for example, if a state is facing uh, an insurgency uh, or if a state is being invaded by another state that it can't defend itself against, it may ask a third party state to come in and uh, help, fight the, help fight the war for them. So one example would be uh, the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq in the first Gulf War. Uh, Kuwait did not have an adequate military, especially relative to Iraq. So uh, the United States went in on their behalf and fought uh, Iraq in the first Gulf War to uh, prevent Kuwait from being overrun by, uh, by Saddam Hussein's uh, Iraqi military. Legitimate authority. So after World War II, once the United Nations is established, uh, the UN Charter states that only the United Nations Security Council can approve war. So the only legitimate body that, uh, may, that uh, may declare when use ad bellum is being correctly abided by is the United Nations Security Council. Uh, though obviously this has uh, become somewhat controversial, right? The second Gulf War, the Iraq War in the 2000s, uh, was not approved by the UN Security Council. Uh, but in most cases, the Security Council is recognized as being the body that legitimately oversees use ad bellum. Uh, and then finally, self-defense. When another state invades your territory, you have the right to defend yourself. Uh, but this becomes complicated. Uh, so there are three further facets that, uh, that determine the legitimacy of uh, an act of self-defense. The first is necessity. Right, so are there adequate non-forceful options to deter or defeat uh, the attack, such as diplomatic avenues? Uh, so you have to exhaust these non-violent measures uh, before you can declare your right to self-defense. Second is uh, proportionality. So, for example, if Canada were to send in uh, a raiding party into America, right, and ransack a village, uh, the United States could not legitimately then uh, nuke Canada, right? That would be a disproportionate reaction. Uh, so anything that a state does to another state uh, can only be met uh, within uh, the principle of self-defense if it is proportional to the original attack. Uh, and then immediacy, right? So there are two respects that immediacy might matter. One is uh, preempting an attack, uh, and another is retaliating after an attack. Uh, so the United States could not lawfully 
go to war with Britain because of the War of 1812, right? That would not be uh, an immediate basis for self-defense. But in the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, if uh, the, the Russian ships carrying nuclear weapons uh, had potentially turned around and faced the American coast, uh, that might have been a legitimate grounds for uh, a self-defense armed attack. Right, so uh, something that is happening in the moment uh, is a legitimate grounds, but something that has happened far in the past uh, or could happen far in the future makes it uh, much murkier, right? The, the legitimate grounds for use ad bellum is much murkier uh, the farther you get from an armed attack. Uh, and we'll see that this becomes somewhat controversial in the war on terror. So uh, Osama bin Laden, sitting in his compound in Pakistan, potentially planning a future attack, uh, is, according to the United States, lawfully killed. Uh, but he was not literally on the territory of the United States uh, or on uh, a military base owned by the United States about to commit an attack, right? So uh, the doctrine of immediacy is one area where use ad bellum uh, is becoming somewhat complicated in contemporary circumstances. Uh, and then some of the uh, official sources of the use ad bellum, right? So it began unofficially in the writings of these thinkers. They established the norm of just war theory uh, and then it started to become institutionalized uh, through these international agreements over time. Uh, so the Kellogg-Bryant uh, Pact uh, was a, a one attempt at the use ad bellum that was somewhat foiled by World War I. Uh, but then after uh, World War II, the United Nations Charter uh, and the London Charter, which was the trial of German uh, war criminals, uh, these two things uh, have been fairly successful at regulating uh, the resort to war. Uh, 